Okay, this is Dr. Morton recording the Micro One Lecture for uh, the 24th of November, last one before Thanksgiving, and uh, we only have uh, two more after Thanksgiving. Uh, so um, today we're going to uh, review for the test. Um, what I'm going to do today is talk about um, uh, kind of the information I want you to know from the modules. I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, I'll just uh, I'll just review some of them. Um, and uh, so um, the ones we basically covered in lecture and covered in lab. So with that, uh, let me shrink this down and we'll get started. So um, yeah. So with respect to the uh, A to D module, um, Yeah, I definitely like you to uh, to know that the A to D module has um, 10 bits of resolution. Now, um, sometimes when we're programming in C, we usually want to take advantage of all 10 bits. When we're doing it in assembly language, it, it is kind of difficult to uh, to deal with um, the extra uh, two bits above the eight. So a lot of times, what we'll do is we'll left shift it. We'll put the upper eight bits in the the high register, and the lower two bits then will be in the low register, and we'll just ignore those uh, because they're the least significant bits. Now, if we really need them, then then probably we should be writing the code in C. Uh, in C, it's really easy. In C, you right shift the result. Again, it shows up in two registers: ADRSH, uh, ADRSH, and ADRSL. H and L mean high and low, so the upper uh, if you right shift it, then the lower eight bits are in the low register and the upper two bits of your 10 bit result are in your high register. And so then what you do is you shift the high register eight bits to the left and just add them together and you get a 16 bit result. Uh, so that's pretty easy in C and that's definitely how you should do it. Uh, and that's what we did. Okay, so, uh, so remembering that we have um, so remembering that we have uh, uh, 10 bits of resolution. Now, how does the A to D actually work? Well, remember we talked about uh, successive approximation. Um, yeah, I, you know what? I do have I do have slides. Maybe I'll bring those up. Hang on one second. Okay, yeah. So here are the peripherals. So I, I'm gonna I'll go through those. Uh, I'll come back and get GPIO in a minute. Um, let's see. Uh, actually. Maybe I should do it like this. Since I already started on the A to D. Uh, GPIO. And then. Okay. I don't know why that's such a difficult thing. Oh. Uh, I don't know why it did that. Okay, A to D. Okay, so 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 the fundamental concept of an A to D is you have an analog voltage and you want to turn you want to be able for the microprocessor to read it and to process it well it, since the microprocessor is a digital device with some analog capability what you have to do is use the a to d converter in the microprocessor and take that analog voltage and turn it into a, a digital representation now there's a lot of different ways of doing that uh, remember for the microprocessor the a to d modules and this is pretty much universally true uh, as long as you're using the internal the internal module, almost all microprocessors uh, f force you uh, the maximum range of the A to D converter is always going to be from from ground to VDD, from ground to VDD, and so um, so that's great. So uh, because because of that, uh, if your actual signal Ha, it doesn't 
conform to that range. Let's say you're running your processor at 3.3 volts. So your maximum signal variation could would be from ground to 3.3 volts. It's not supposed to go to below ground and it can't go above 3.3 volts. If it goes a little bit below ground or a little bit above 3.3 volts, it'll just below ground, it'll read zero. At 3.3 volts, it'll be maxed out at the max value. So even if you go to four volts, for instance, you'll still read uh, 1023 as your maximum value. Now, uh, the problem is though that the chip doesn't like those, uh, those uh, voltage excursions below its limits. And at some point, you'll get into trouble and damage the chip. So it, let's say you have a signal that's plus or minus 10 volts. Well, that's not going to work at all. So how do you deal with that? What you do is you take a little operational amplifier and you, you shift, you, you attenuate the signal so that now it only varies over a 3 volt range. And then you shift, you DC shift the, uh, the center of the frequency to, uh, what, 1.7 volts or something like that. So now, it's, so now it's varying from 0 to 3.3. So the, what was minus 10 is now 0 volts. What was plus 10 is now 3.3 volts. And you, you can uh, fine tune the, uh, the, the operational amplifier to, to do just that. And you just need one good operational amplifier to make that work. And if you've got a rail-to-rail -rail op amp, you can even run it at, uh, uh, on the same uh, voltage that your chip's running at, 0 to 3.3. Uh, so this is a great method, and you should be familiar with that. Uh, I, I haven't really covered that in this course. I, I really like to have a lab that does that. Interestingly, there are some microprocessors uh, in the PIC family uh, that have uh, operational amps built in, and you can, uh, you can just do that on the front end. Um, all right. So that's usually how we, how we uh, condition a signal if we need to so that it comports to the analog uh, uh, converter, analog to digital converter. Um, the, the precision of the converter is defined by the number of bits, in this case 10. So that means you, 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 you can take your, uh, your 0 to 3.3 volts and divide it by 1024. And uh, so if we do that, we'll take 3.3 uh, volts and we'll divide it by 1024. And we'll get that each bit represents 0 0.003 or three micro uh, three millivolts, 3.22 millivolts. Now that's a funny number. You can actually make that a little nicer for calculations if you want. You don't have to. What you can do is you can use the instead of running the A to D from uh, z from zero volts to uh, 3.3 volts, you can set up your uh, fixed voltage reference. For, to put out a voltage of uh, uh, 2.048 volts, uh, you, can, you can put out 1.0, uh, sorry, 1.024, 2.048, or, uh, or 4.096, uh, uh, 92, I guess, whatever it is. Here, let me, let me pull it up in the data sheet. I have trouble with this, doing it since... Uh, where's my data sheet? Here. All right. So if we go down to fixed voltage reference, it's uh, here. So your choices are 1024, 2048, and 4096. So if you're running at 5 volts and you do 4096, that actually works pretty well. But if you're running at 3.3 volts, then you have to pick the 2048. All right. So now... So if you do 2048, now if you take uh, 2048 and divide it by by our 10 bits of resolution, which is 102024. Now, uh, uh, well, yeah, it's now that's two uh, two millivolts per uh, bit, two millivolts per bit. So that's actually kind of nice. And, uh, and that makes it kind of easy. Then you just multiply uh, by your reading by 2, and you get the answer in millivolts. So, um, so sometimes using the fixed voltage reference makes the calculations a little better, but it's not that big a deal. You can do it either way. As long as, you're, as, long as the computer is handling the math, you probably don't really care. Okay, um, so, so uh, 
uh, the chip has a number of analog channels. It actually has uh, 12 analog channels. Now, those, now not every pin has an analog number. In fact, again, if we want to know about the analog numbers, we have to go to the data sheet. Uh, and so if we go to the data sheet, it's easiest to look at the, at the, uh, at the, at this uh, 20 pin allocation table. And if you look down this, you can see here's the A to D. AN0 is RA0, AN1 is RA1, and so forth. So, so RA3 doesn't have an analog input, RA5 doesn't have one. RB6 and RB7 don't have analog inputs. RC4 and 5 don't have either. So there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 pins that don't have analog inputs. And, uh, and then power and ground obviously don't. So that's 8 pins. So out of your 20 pins, uh, 12 of them have analog inputs, 8 of them don't. Um, and 2 of them are being taken up by your, by your uh, in-circuit serial programming header debugger. So, uh, so these are not really available to you either unless you use jumpers and you don't want to debug in real time, and that's fine. Okay, so, the, uh, so, there, so you have 10 bits of resolution, you have 12 channels. Now, the way this works, oh, I guess I should go back. Well, uh, when you change channels, you have to keep in mind one thing. When you change channels, you have to wait... Uh, maybe a millisecond, actually probably only about uh, 50 microseconds to give the sampling capacitor time to charge up to the input voltage level uh, or time to discharge to the input voltage, voltage level. And so that's, that's a little bit of a limitation. Um, and then, then you take 13 clock cycles when you're running your conversion clock at uh, one, uh, one megahertz. Uh, so uh, so you, you basically take to do a conversion you have to take something like uh, something like 14 or 15 uh, uh, um, microseconds uh, to get that done um, and that's that's that that's partly what defines your band limit obviously you have to double that because you have to sample twice uh, so 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 it's something like about 30 microseconds uh, to get to meet the Nyquist criteria. So if you invert 30 microseconds, that gives you the maximum frequency you could ever hope to do. Now, of course, you still have some issues with um, uh, restarting the uh, the process and all. There's probably a little more overhead. So let's see if we go back to the uh, if we go back to the calculator. And we take we in, we take 30 milliseconds and we invert it. So we put in uh, point, uh, 30 microseconds rather, 0, 0, 0, 0, 3, 0. Well, let's say 35 just for grins. Add a little padding in there. And we flip that. So, uh, so that's something like, uh, so, so that would be about 28,000. So, so your absolute, absolute maximum would be about 28K. But you really can't. You, you really can't you can't do it that fast because there's still some overhead you have to still have to move the values out and store them in a buffer so you have to add a few more milliseconds but in any event that's somewhere around the maximum conversion you know uh, uh, maximum frequency you can convert with this processor um, that's actually I think a bit of an exaggeration but in any event uh, so um, the uh, here's the here's your 10-bit A to C and here is your multiplexer. So here are your 12 input channels, plus there are three internal signals that you can also sample. You can sample your internal temperature indicator. You can sample your digital to analog output. And you can sample your fixed voltage buffer. If you just want to check and see how accurate that is, that you could do that. You can also select the fixed voltage buffer uh, uh, as your positive analog reference. Uh, you get three choices, VDD, the fixed voltage reference, and an external pin. For your negative reference, all you get is ground and ground and the external pin. 
remember though that the external pins cannot exceed ground on the negative side and uh, VDD on the positive side. So, all right, so here's your, here's your module. And uh, so you turn it on and then, um, let's see, I think, yeah. So here's the sample and hole capacitor here. And I, I think, I thought I had a better picture of that. Maybe not. Okay, so I guess I don't. I think there is one somewhere. Anyway, this is your successive approximation register. And uh, remembering it uses, essentially it uses a digital to analog converter. And it has to, it, this, the resolution of this has to be equal to the resolution of your overall conversion process. So if we have 10 bits of resolution, this has to be a 10 bit DAC. And what it does, you have a, 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 a register here, you set all the bits to zero, and then you turn the higher order bit onto a one. And that causes this DAC to output half the voltage uh, of uh, VDD to the comparator. Then the comparator com compares the voltage on the sample and hole capacitor. The sample and hole capacitor initially is connected to the signal, but when you begin the conversion, it's disconnected. Uh, and, that, and that way it, its value is not changing. Since the impedance into this comparator is extremely high, there's very little current leaking off of this sample and hole capacitor. And so it holds the value pretty accurately. And then you compare it. And you basically start with the high order bit. And you either, if it compares uh, high, you turn the bit off and set the next bit. If it compares low, you leave the bit on and set the next bit. And you keep working your way down until you get to the last bit and you either leave it on or off. And then you have a 10 bit result plus or minus one bit. Uh, so that's how that works. Okay, um, so that's good. All right, I spent a little more time on that. Let me go back to my uh, questions. All right, so, um, so, so if you, if you put in, if you take a jumper and connect your analog input into, uh, directly to VDD, assuming you're, you're using VDD as your max reference, what should your uh, A to D uh, read after it samples that and converts it to a digital value? And the answer is it should read 1020, 1023. That's the maximum value it can read. Uh, so uh, how many simultaneous conversions can, the, can this chip do? Well, it only has one A to D converter, so it only can do one at a time. Now, there are some chips with two ADC uh, modules. They can do simultaneous conversions on two different inputs. And you could even have, there are some chips with more than that, I guess. But in this family, I think the most is two. Um, that, may be, that may hold throughout. Um, so, um, sometimes you do want to, um, uh, so you, you may you may want to condition your signal. What you typically want to do, you want your signal to f pretty much fill up the available range uh, from zero to uh, say VDD if you're using that whole range, or if you're using the fixed voltage reference from zero to the fixed voltage reference, or if you're using an external reference, you might shrink that down maybe to just one volt from zero to one volt or something, depending on what your actual input signal is. So, so there's So there's uh, so you want to get the maximum, you want to get your the variation of your signal. You want to get it constrained to the the full 10 bit range of your A to D to get the most accurate readings. Um, okay, now some modules, not not this one on this chip, but some modules allow you to set up a scan sequence among the channels, and it allows you to automatically scan through certain channels. Uh, and, and convert them, and then go to the next channel and convert it, and you can set up some arbitrary scan sequence. Um, this chip doesn't do that, but some chips in this family do allow for that. Um, okay, I think I covered that. Um, yeah. So, uh, and then we talked about, oh, that you can, you can have it generate an interrupt when it finishes the conversion. So you can go uh, get the value and start a new conversion. And that's one way you can, you can get maximum sampling rates. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, 
Yeah. So uh, if you have an analog signal that varies from minus 5 volts to plus 5 volts, how could you use the A to D module in the PIC to sample it? Can, can you connect it directly to the A to D and, uh, and use external voltage references of minus 5 and plus 5? No, because you can't go below ground. Can you use an op-amp circuit and condition the signal to vary between ground and VDD? Yes, you definitely could do that. Can you use a resistor ladder to condition the signal? No, you really can't. Uh, I mean, you could, you could, that would be a poor man's solution, but the, the resistor ladder still couldn't handle the minus five volts. Uh, for that, you have to DC shift it, and to DC shift it, you really have to have an active device like a, like a uh, um, operational amplifier. Okay, um, so let's go on to the next one. Um, let's talk about PWM just a little bit. Uh, let's see, I'm going to I'm gonna pop off that, and then we'll, we'll find PWM here. Let's see, go back to here. Um, and see if we can do that. All right, PWM. All right, so uh, PWM. So, um, so what is it, what are the real advantages of PWM? The real advantages of PWM is that you can you can have you can linearize your control over the power delivered to a nonlinear device. Now, in the old days, the way we deliver the way we varied the power delivered to a device, we we varied the voltage. But that's a terrible way if the device is super nonlinear with respect to voltage. And an, and an LED is a great example of that. Uh, you start with, say, let's say your LED has to have 1.8 volts. Uh, it, it has a 1.8 voltage drop across it. So until your voltage gets something really close to 1.8 volts, the LED will deliver no light. When you hit exactly 1.8 volts, it might glow real dimly. And then as you ramp up past 1.8 volts, the current starts to increase pretty dramatically, and, and the LED very quickly gets to full brightness. And, and then once you get, say, maybe to 2.5 volts, you see very little change in the LED brightness. So you have a really narrow window where just a teeny change in voltage makes a big change in the current flowing and makes a big change in brightness. And so as a result, you, you don't get good... Uh, brightness control by varying voltage. Now you you can do that. It's it's a sort of a poor man's solution, but it's it's not the way to get nice uh, nice continual variations in your um, uh, uh, in your uh, intensity of your uh, LED. So a better way to do it is to is to run is to have the output be a fixed voltage so that uh, so that the LED is fully on, and then limit how long that fixed voltage actually is there. So that's what we call PWM. So we have a, we have a, a repetition rate. So every so many, uh, you know, every so many um, uh, milliseconds, we repeat the PWM window. And then within that window, we turn on the power all the way up to the, to the driving voltage and we leave it there uh, for some percentage of that window, maybe uh, maybe say 50%. If we leave it there for the whole window, which would be 100%, and we call that the duty cycle, then the LED is going to be getting full power. It'll be at full brightness for that voltage, which again is pretty nonlinear. So once you once you get it to optimum voltage, there's you don't really want to increase it, the current flowing through it by increasing the voltage much beyond that because all you'll do is uh, cause the LED to get hot and degrade its lifetime. So, uh, so we want to we want to run it at about 20 milliamps. And so you you do the calculation. You put in a current limiting resistor, and so so at, at say five volts, you know that maybe you need something like 150 ohm current limiting resistor or 220. I, I think we use typically 220 ohms, something like that. And the 220 ohm resistor then works pretty well to uh, give you about 20 milliamps. You can do the calculations, but in any event, with that with that current running through the LED, then uh, it'll be at essentially maximum usable brightness. You can increase it slightly, but that's at the risk of making it heat up, and eventually, over time, that that 
thermal abuse will, will cause it to fail or degrade, and then it'll slowly get dimmer, eventually maybe fade, or it may fade suddenly. So you don't want that. So you, you want to keep that, that drive current to basically what the LED is rated at. And say, typically most small LEDs are, are rated at uh, about 20 milliamps. Okay, but what you can do instead, you can let that 20 milliamps run for just some small portion of your, of the, of your PWM window. So if you let it run for, say, 1% of the window, then you, your LED will be pretty dim. Now, there are some caveats on this. You, you have to have your repetition rates got to be fast enough that you don't see a bunch of flickering, but slow enough that the LED can fully respond. So if you if you try and run it at you know hundreds of kilohertz rates or megahertz rates, the LED can't respond that fast, and so it won't really work very well. And if you run it super slow, like at say uh, 25 hertz, uh, you'll see you'll see it blinking, and so it'll be distracting. It won't really it won't it won't smooth out that intensity and and appear to be on continuously. You'll actually see it blinking, and so you don't want that either. So you definitely you definitely have some some constraints. Um, all right, so uh, so one of the things let me I'm going to put this in here. So one of the things that uh, that sometimes we do is we um, we we have this pulse period here. So from the start of one pulse, one PWM PWM pulse to the next pulse, we call that the pulse repetition interval or you can call it the pulse window. There are a lot of things you can call it. The percentage of time that it's high in that window, we call the duty cycle. So in this case, you're seeing that one, two, three, four, you're seeing that this is roughly a 25% duty cycle in, in this pulse window. Now, without a time axis, we don't know how big that pulse window is, but uh, but that's that's typically how we see it. And the reason we like to use this PWM is because it's nonlinear. Uh, so it uh, uh, well but we we like to use it for nonlinear devices. Motors are another good example of that. Um, so if we if we uh, if we use motors, what we find is that well that some devices only work on well some some so like when you're running a motor uh, below a certain voltage, the motor is just going to stall. So if you're trying to control the motor speed with voltage, it works sort of, but it only works, uh, it, it also changes the torque pretty dramatically. So if you want a lot of torque, but you want very low speed, that's not going to work because your torque is going to be somewhat proportional to your voltage. So what we do instead is we use PWM and we give it either maximum voltage or we give it zero, but we change the percent of time that it's on in our, in our PWM window. And when we do that, uh, we can actually still have pretty good torque and very low speed. And if you've ever used a hand battery powered drill, you know that uh, even at slow tor at slow speed, those things have a pretty good torque. Uh, so clearly with full power, they get a little more torque, but, but even with partial power, uh, they, they can have pretty good torque. And you can definitely have fine speed control with those devices. Um, so and that's partly because this the, the, the motor involved is very nonlinear, right? It, it, it doesn't, its power, its RPM and, and uh, doesn't vary uh, in a perfectly linear way with voltage. Uh, if, you, it, if you try and run it too slow, it will eventually stall out because the voltage is insufficient to provide even, even a minimal amount of torque uh, to, uh, say, turn a screw, for instance, with a handheld uh, driver or, or drill. Uh, there's some devices that are just pr set up to use PWM, like servos are are designed to work off PWM, uh, and they they require a certain fixed uh, pulse repetition rate, and then their the the actual duty cycle. The only useful variation of the duty cycle is from one per, uh, is from uh, is from about five percent to about seven and a half percent. No, five uh, percent to ten percent. So from one millisecond to two milliseconds in a 20 millisecond pulse window. All right, um, all right, let's see. Um, interrupts. So we definitely used interrupts um, on this device. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll do this, move this over here. 
Let's bring this up. So what interrupts can occur when the global interrupt enable bit is cleared? Well, none of them, because the global interrupt bit turns on and off all interrupts. Now, you have other bits. The, you have the peripheral interrupt bit that controls all the peripheral interrupts. And you have then, uh, then individual peripheral interrupt enable registers that basically select uh, which bits in which modules are active. And then you have a couple of bits that don't go through the peripheral interrupt uh, stuff. That's the interrupt on change and then the one interrupt bit and uh, yeah, I th and maybe your timer zero interrupt. So there's a few others that, that kind of fall outside the normal, the normal uh, con uh, uh, setup because they were legacy devices and, and microchip just left them that way. Um, okay, so... Uh, the interrupt on the interrupt on change really is only uh, allowed for port uh, A and B. It's not set up for port C. Um, what's an interrupt vector? An interrupt vector then uh, is the address that the processor hands control off to when an interrupt occurs. In our chip, it's a fixed number. It's fixed at, at program address location four. You can't change that. What you can do is put a branch there to go someplace else, but you can't change that that's the, going to be the first instruction executed in the interrupt. And and the nice thing in the interrupt, it automatically turns off the global interrupt enable bit, but what it does not do is automatically clear the flag that triggered the interrupt. So you have to go clear that flag in your interrupt service routine, otherwise you will re-interrupt. Um, now, wh where, are the, where are all the return addresses and you know where where's all where, where's the return address saved, and then we also save uh, we save uh, a bunch of the we save the indirect registers, we save the BSR, we save the PC uh, uh, the PC uh, the PC latch uh, high, we save the uh, W register, um, and we save the status register. Where do we save those registers? Uh, and the answer is they get pushed into shadow registers. These are hardware registers that are specifically designed to save those registers in an interrupt. And when you return from an interrupt, they're restored from those shadow registers. So you can pick right back up wherever you left off with exactly the same setting in all those uh, system registers. Um, so uh, what happens if you don't clear the interrupt flag? Well, as soon as you return from interrupt, the global interrupt enable bit is automatically set again, enabling interrupts. So you will immediately re-interrupt and you'll just stay you'll in that crazy cycle of interrupt, 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 interrupt. Uh, you'll never get out of the interrupt routine. Um, so let's see. Um, oh, let's see. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think that's it. Okay. So let's see. What else? Um, we'll get through. The LCD display. So we've talked about these at great length, and you've used them. So you know these are the connections right here. You have ground, VDD, contrast. Let's see. Let me switch this out. Uh, and we'll see if we can find it here. Let's see. It should be here. Okay. So here's LCD. So we'll just go over this. So first off, uh, these are mostly loosely based on the Atashi uh, HD 44780, which is a uh, which is a great little chip. Uh, obviously, there have been other people make similar chips now. It's probably it's probably uh, way out of patent anyway. So it's probably just been copied uh, back, you know, reverse engineered and copied. Uh, and uh, Let's see how we're doing. Yeah, 34. Okay, we'll go just a little bit longer. Um, yeah, we got a little bit. So, and and its interface is basically pretty standard. And here it is. So you have you have ground and power, and then you have this contrast line. Now in the old days, the contrast line was a lot more complicated than it is now. Uh, well, well anyway, uh, but. Uh, because in the old days, you sometimes needed to use some minus voltage to actually get really good contrast. Uh, but now you can get really good contrast with just a small positive voltage. 
It is nice though to have a potentiometer so you can vary this. And and on the uh, on the I2C adapter boards that that solder on the back of these standard L, uh, LCD modules, uh, those little boards have a built-in pot as you know, and you can turn that and change the contrast. And you can certainly change it so you can't see anything at all. Uh, and you can turn it so you can get a pretty good a pretty good uh, uh, visible display. The backlights on these used to be weird stuff, but now they're all just LEDs. Uh, but in the old days, we used, um, uh, oh, I forgot the name of it. Um, so, yeah, some of them use electric electroluminescent the displays. Let me see, I think I actually have a slide on that. Um, so currently, almost all devices are using LEDs, but historically, uh, we had this uh, this this uh, powder phosphor based electroluminescent panels and uh, they provide this gentle even illumination while consuming relatively little power uh, which was great however uh, they required relatively high voltage between 60 and 600 volts and so you had to have a circuit that would generate this voltage plus on top of that uh, because you typically had to generate a uh, you had to use a, a small boost transformer you had to generate uh, a chopped uh, square wave uh, or something, and usually that would create a little uh, a little whine uh, that you could actually hear these things. So anyway, uh, less circuitry now, and it's a lot easier just to use the standard backlights. They come in uh, a number of different form factors. Here's the the LCD glass, and this metal bezel uh, connects it to the printed circuit board, where all the various traces. Uh, uh, make contact with the glass uh, and there's actually a circuit built into the glass. Um, these little blobs on the back are chip are blob on chips and, and these these actually have a, a, a little die and then their bonding wires connected from the die uh, to the printed circuit board. Very very small very very fine bonding wires and then these are protected by this epoxy coating. And that's why it's called blob on board. And they do that because it gives them uh, the cheapest cost. Uh, they can buy these chips and as cheap as possible. They don't have to. They don't have to package them. They don't, the company selling the chips doesn't have to put on the bonding wires, um, and it just makes them as inexpensive as possible. And in fact, sometimes they'll buy the whole the whole uh, wafer and they'll they'll saw them. Uh, uh, they saw the individual dies apart on their own, uh, saving a little more money. So, um, yeah. So it's nice that these can be interfaced directly to a microprocessor. You can use a six-pin interface and run the device in four-bit mode, um, with uh, uh, where you can't read the busy bit, but you really don't need to do that. You can also use seven pins, and then you can read the busy bit. Or you can use 11 pins and do an 8-wire interface, but there's really no major advantage to the 8-bit to the eight, eight, eight uh, data connection over the 4-bit data connection. Um, what we use with our, our little I2C interface is we use this PCF8574 chip. Uh, and it does have, it gives you 8 pins, so that allows you this 7-pin 4-wire interface uh, plus one bit left over to turn on and off the backlight if you want to want to do that. Um, so um, when you if you do the four if you do the four bit mode, then it's the high four bits, it's D, data bit four, five, six, and seven that are used in four bit mode, whereas data zero, one, two, three are only used in along with the upper bits in eight bit mode. But in four bit mode they're ignored. And remember, we have the RS line that uh, is where we send either command or data. And then if we're going to read the chip, we have to change the RW line. Normally, we leave it in zero uh, because we're going to write to the chip. And then uh, the E line is basically like, uh, like the clock. We, we have to toggle it to latch in uh, our new data. Okay. Uh, so... Um, Current devices use pretty much, uh, yeah, I said that. We covered this, my bad. And then you remember this reference by Julian Eilert, a really good article. You can 
pull this up and read it. It's on Blackboard on the front page. And here's a different way to represent those commands. Um, uh, I like the Julian Islet thing a little better, but but there's there's a whole bunch of commands. And so uh, this gives you you can you can basically uh, set the cursor to wherever you want, um, and then write the data there. Uh, you remember that the way the uh, the way the cells are numbered is a little uh, uh, surprising. The top row is zero zero through zero F, but the the second row in our two row two line by sixteen LC display, the second row is uh, four zero through four F. So, um, and the maximum you can have is uh, uh, eighty characters, and th so that can be two rows of forty, four rows of twenty, uh, whatever. And there are various formats set up out there. Um, here's the one, this is the one, the Julian Islet thing. Um, and basically the steps, uh, when you, when you, once you put it in two line mode, you have to be real careful that you never change it back to four line mode. Um, okay. So yeah, we did that. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go through this. Uh, yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let me cover touch sensing, and then and then we'll I think we'll stop with this for today. So touch sensing then is another uh, area that's really interesting. Um, so there are a whole bunch of different types of touch sensors. Now in in uh, in micro two we we we've made some some. Uh, some tilt tables, and the way we read, we balance a steel ball on top of the tilt table. Well, the way we tell where the steel ball is, we put a resistive four wire touch panel on top of the board. And then uh, the microprocessor reads the ball position by uh, using this four wire resistive uh, uh, touch pad. And it's pretty cool the way that works. You, you uh, uh, let's see, I probably got a slide. Let me, um, let me pause this and get that slide up. So here's how that resistive touch panel works, uh, you basically have uh, a fairly stiff uh, rear glass and then you have a little more flexible front piece of glass and then bet both of these are coated with a transparent uh, conductive coating that has uh, some amount of resistance in it. Uh, uh, in our panels the resistance is about 500 to 600 ohms this way and about 250 to 350 ohms this way, because it's a shorter distance, it's rectangular. Uh, and then when you, you have little elastic spacer dots between the layers, and when you push with a ball or your finger, you, you push the conductive film on the top layer in contact with the conductive film on the bottom layer. And so you record a position. Now the, you, the way you have to do this, it's a little tricky, but you have to you have to multiplex these lines. So the first thing you do is you put a voltage. Say we're going to read the uh, say we're going to read the x position, uh, or well let's read the y position. So what you do is you put say five volts up here and zero volts down here on the whole edge. And there's little uh, there's electrodes that allow you to do that. And then you use one of the electrodes in this layer to uh, to read here. So when you touch, you're going to divide the voltage between R3 and R4. And so if you're really close down here, you're going to be close to ground. And if you're really up here, you're going to be close to 5 volts. And then uh, you connect R1 then. You connect this output of R1, or this, this edge here, to your A to D converter. Now the A to D converter takes very little current. So there's very little voltage dropped across this resistance here. And, and obviously, that resistance can vary depending on where your finger is, uh, but you're just looking at the, the the vertical change, and the vertical change here. Then say it's uh, say it's reading, you know, uh, I don't know. Say it's reading two and a half volts. Well, then uh, you read this in through this resistor, and the A to D converter gets something very close to two and a half volts. Again, because there's very little voltage drop across this resistance, because there's very, very little current flowing. And as a result, you read uh, two and a half volts, and then uh, then the uh, your software then knows where that 
two and a half volts puts this. Now, typically there is some non-linearity in these panels and there's also some translation and rotational effects that you have to you have to correct for all these. And but you can do that by measuring by calibrating the, the panel to begin with and using some linear algebra to get those uh, scaling factors. Uh, and once you do that then you get pretty good results over the over the surface of the panel. Uh, now now what you do is so now you have your Y position. Now you change it around. You put a voltage uh, ground on this side and five volts on this edge of the panel. And then you send, say, the output of R3 or this top edge goes to the, the A to D converter. And now it's reading the, volta, the voltage divider in the X direction. So now you can get the X value. And there's so little current that the, I, that the uh, R3 uh, component here is basically pretty much ignored. And so, so that really works out pretty well. You have to do that very quickly, uh, maybe you know, uh, you know, hundreds of times a second, so that you can track this position as it moves, and and so that's how this resistive touch panel works. Now we're not using a touch panel per se; we're using a touch button, and uh, so that's a little different. So uh, there, so we're using a capacitive uh, touch sensing, uh, and what we do, we set up a capacitive, uh, uh, we set up a, an RC oscillator to use the touch pad as part of its capacitance. And when you touch it, you increase that capacitance, you, you change the frequency of that little RC oscillator. And we use a little counter to count that, uh, those oscillations. Uh, we have a little time base, so it takes two timers, one to set up a time base, and then the other to count the number of pulses during that time base, which gives us a, uh, a reproducible measure of the frequency. Now we'd actually have to do some calculations, but we don't care what the actual frequency is. We just want to know if it changes below a certain threshold, which tells us that it's been touched. Now, uh, you can make much more sophisticated touch panels uh, by including things like uh, guard rings uh, and then area sensors and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, shifting uh, thresholds that, that depend on a number of other factors. Um, the, uh, the touch panel that we're using has some fatal flaws in it, and, and this particular technology has now been abandoned by microchip in favor of, of using the analog to digital converter, and uh, they use a technique. Um, so the, the new uh, technology that microchip uses is a is a is a differential self capacitance, and they they actually use the 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 computing A to D module, which we we don't have a computing A to D module. We actually have a, a touch sensing module. It's the old touch sensing module on this chip, and and it works fine. It works great for our purposes, but it does have some some uh, some uh, some failure modes that uh, became quite distressing for microchip when they tried to compete with other technologies. And they finally had to sort of uh, abandon this approach and go to uh, this uh, uh, this uh, computing ADC based uh, differential self capacitance uh, uh, model. One of the advantages that this gives them with their new uh, approach is that they can do. Uh, you don't even have to touch the pads. You can do. Uh, you can have larger pads and you can do uh, gestures where you don't even touch the pad, um, and they're much less sensitive to noise. Uh, the, 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 model, the product we're using, if you create noise in the right frequency, uh, it will completely uh, uh, screw up the function of this, of this touch sensing module. As long as you don't have that, that kind of noise in your environment, you're fine. It works great. But uh, it does have that Achilles tendon sort of failure mode. And uh, so that's why they abandoned it. So, but the way this module works, and it's instructive because it it sort of tells you how it's the same sort of principle. They've just um, refined it, uh, and uh, anyway, this module basically measures the change in the, in the capacitance of the touchpad and the tuned circuit. Okay, um, so you can use you have as many capacitive sense sensing uh, inputs. Uh, as you do have A to D inputs, they're all the same analog inputs, and you have 12 in the 1829 chip. Uh, 
So you, you typically, to, to make this work fairly well, you use timer zero and timer one. And uh, timer zero is our fixed base counter, our time base counter, and timer one counts the, uh, the fluctuations. The use of timer one gives us uh, a, uh, up to 16 bits of count. And so that's, uh, that really does help give us uh, better discrimination. And then what we do is we, we record how many counts we get in timer one when the pad's not touched and we record how many counts it gives when it is touched. And, uh, and usually the, the number of counts is always gonna go down because when you touch it, you increase the capacitance, you decrease the frequency, so the number of counts goes down and uh, because they're proportional to frequency. And the longer timer zero counts, the, the bigger the number you, you would have in the untouched mode, and, and, uh, and so you'd have a little better discrimination. And uh, so this works pretty well. It works well enough that on our four touch pads on our, uh, on our Viva board, uh, we can use a single threshold to discriminate between them. Again, uh, there are some noise environments that would, that would uh, uh, cause this not to work very well. But uh, when we use it in the lab like we do, it, it works fine. Okay, um, so this is how it works. You use timer zero for the time base. You use timer one to count the pulses. And here's your touch sensing module. Uh, which basically it's just a little oscillator uh, and it connects then to one of, to one of these outputs which four of ours connect to the touch pads. Um, and I forget which four they are. Uh, I know it's uh, RA5, RA2, RC6, and there's one more I forget. Or there's, yeah, there's one more. I forget which one that is. But it's in, there. It's in our data sheet. Um, okay. Well, I think I'm going to... Uh, Let's see what else. Um, yeah, well, I think that's pretty well done. Okay, I think I'm going to stop with that, and uh, we'll pick up and cover more of the peripherals then uh, on Thursday, on uh, a, a, a Tuesday of next week, and Tuesday, uh, and then Thursday of next week uh, will be our last class. So just two more classes after today. All right, we will talk with you later. So um, let me bring this out though for a second. Uh, so I really want everybody to be working on your, working on your project. So uh, if you need to scale it down to get it done, I'd rather you do that. Uh, if you're uh, getting really frustrated, uh, uh, then I, I'll come in at noon. So, oh yeah, that's now. I better get on that. Okay, we'll talk to you later.